Um, so I think we're just going to jump into it because we have about an hour and we don't waste probably any time here. So if I, if we were talking about that, we're going to talk the resurrection and NDEs and we're going to cluster them up a little bit. Um, so the, um, so take as much time as you need to answer any question, Dr. Habermas. I don't want to feel you to be hurried in any way. So, um, I guess we'll start off with the resurrection if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm kind of used to those questions. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, could you shed light on a particular survey you conducted regarding the empty tomb a few, a few years back that involved New Testament scholars ranging from 1975 to present? And is it true that did 75% of those scholars really affirm an empty tomb? Yeah, you're talking about the study that started in in uh, nineteen about 1990, and it went back to 70, 75, and ahead. So at that point, when it started, it was about last 15 years. And by the time I finished it, um, an article I had an article published in a in a uh, critical journal where I gave some of the results, and that was in 2005. So. The results I gave back in 2005 covered, let's say, 30 years, and the figure of the those I surveyed uh, was about 75% positive responses to the empty tomb, and uh, you know, you know how the surveys go: 25% right. negative, but you're going to have some who don't answer it, or some who say I don't know, or whatever. But it wasn't a survey per se. It was a survey done while I, where I read their sources. Okay. Then I just finished an update on that, which from 2005 um, would be uh, getting close to 20 years because the article was published in 2005, but it was written a year or two before that. So we're um, almost 20 years past that. And I just did a survey. I just finished a survey of about 250 critical scholars. And the percentage on the empty tomb has actually increased from 75% to 80%. Now, that's not a huge increase, but, wow. but it's like anything else. It's going up, not down. So, uh, you know, I, I was glad to see that. That is amazing. And are, are these the ones who pulled or are part of the poll or how you were organizing it? Are these non-Christian, like, like, are these like secular people or are they just predominantly Christian scholars? Okay. It's about everything you can think of. Now, let me define my audience. Number one, I didn't interview living people. Number two, I didn't take a survey. What I did was I surveyed over 250 scholars according to their works. So I might have in that group, I might have had 325 works with mm -hmm. some of them being duplicates. You know, for John Doe, I could have four books for him and three for somebody else. Right. But there were 200 and over 250 separate scholars. Now, secondly, how do I define scholar? A scholar is a person in my uh, definition, a person who has a terminal degree, usually a PhD or a, a DTHL from Europe or a THD, but a terminal research degree in a, in a topic that's apropos to New Testament studies. So it could be any of the following, it could be um, New Testament, theology, classics, like classical, uh, like ancient Greek, Greco-Roman writers. Um, there's P there are a lot of PhDs in that area. Uh, ancient history, philosophy, archaeology. People who have terminal degrees in one of those areas, and of course, the closer they are to the area, the more I'm interested, but it's without respect to what they believe. It's without respect to whether they call themselves believers, whether they call themselves liberals, whether they say, I'm not a Christian, and you'd be surprised how many are in each of these categories. I had a number of atheists, a, a fairly large number of atheists and other skeptics, um, agnostics, uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, I, oh, another, another field would be a PhD in religion, general religion. And I had a number of religious writers who were not Christian. They were, uh, you know, Jewish, non-Christians or, or other fields. So there's a wide smattering of people. But this is what I insist on. A lot of diversity, a lot of diversity. But here's the only thing I, I insist on. They've got to be scholars writing in a field of their expertise as defined by a terminal degree in that area. Uh, and uh, they have to publish on that subject for me to count it. I have to be able to read their writings. Um, here's who I don't count. Many of the people who sound off today and many of the people I get emails from are overly, I, I don't know how to say it and be nice, but overly rambunctious people who want to make comments and tell me how my how my ideas are stupid and how they don't agree. And they've gotten never gotten close to a university or a degree from their own bios. Uh, they, they're not doing anything. They're just kind of, to me, talking off the top of their head. And they might be doing some research. They might be doing some reading on their own. But the point about going to a university seminary or a college that's accredited, the point is, You've got people, professors and others, who hold your feet to the fire, so to speak. They, they're they making sure you're doing the right research. We're not just surveying people. This is not survey says. This is not who do you want for a certain position in politics. Right. They have to have something behind them. So I don't count just folks that just – I had a, I had a prominent atheist write to me and said – I don't know how many people you got against the empty tomb, but no matter what your number is, I could give you a larger number for my friends and acquaintances. And I'm thinking to myself, it's not your friends and acquaintances I'm looking for, unless <laughs> they have PhDs in these subjects. I, I don't right. go door to door in a Christian neighborhood and ask them if they believe in the empty tomb. And uh, so I would try to be specific. A scholar in a relevant field who you know knows the material uh, with a terminal degree in that area, and they're telling me about the empty tomb. It's that easy. I have a lot, a lot, a lot of people who either don't call themselves Christians, who say they're not Christians, or say they're definitely not conservative Christians. And they could just as easily count against the empty tomb as a non-Christian could. So the fact that it came to 80%, I think is rather amazing. When I think almost anybody who knows the field would know the names I'm using and they wouldn't be able to criticize the names. Incredible. That is very telling, and I appreciate that, Dr. Habermas. Uh, this next question goes in line with my last question. In your opinion, has non-Christian scholars and historians em embraced your six minimal facts approach? And if not, why? Well, virtually everybody does. Some have seen it out there, and the ones that have made the comments on it, uh, one uh, – let me let me boil this down. I I go to a list of twelve that every pretty much everybody agrees to, and from that twelve, I gather six of them, which I call the six minimal facts. Okay, I had a a, a world famous atheist in the field write to me and say, actually he published this in a book. Oh, he has written to me, but he published this in a book. He said. I'm okay with all 12 facts, except for one of them. And the one he didn't allow was one of the 12, but not one of the six. In other words, it was not one of the minimal facts. Right. So I, I assume from the question, that means he's fine with the minimal facts. Dale Allison, a, a, a professor at Princeton Seminary, and he's written two books on the resurrection. Really great guy, good friend of mine, but he's often known even to critics. Uh, I had one of the one of the, well, a very well-known atheist tell me they love Dale because he seems very skeptical and open to the data. Well, Dale just said in a recent book, just came out, uh, he just said that he that he accepts the minimal facts. So you don't have a lot of people saying, well, let me think about these minimal facts. But those who say it usually have no problem. And even if they're not talking about the minimal facts or just talking about the data, I'm not sure that virtually anybody has gone against it. I can think of a, uh, a, you know, a scholar or two here and there that might dispute this one or that one, but they're not easily or generally disputed. 
Yeah, that sounds what I was thinking too, that it's generally going to be accepted and embraced. Um, I appreciate right. that. Um, so my next question is, well, skeptics of the pre-Pauline creed say that 500 witnesses of the resurrection is useless to appeal to because there's no names or identifications attached to them that could verify them as being legit. So what would you say in response to that? Okay, I'm, I would smile to start with because that's not the way historians talk. Historians don't say, Herodotus talks about this war in ancient Greece, and he says there's thousands of guys on one side and half that number on the other side, but I think he's totally wacko because he doesn't even, he doesn't name 5,000 men, obviously, but he doesn't even give the generals names. He doesn't even, he doesn't give key facts like that. Uh, they don't do that. And just because you don't have the names and addresses and phone numbers of the 500, to me, that's kind of a, 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 a little bit of a, a no, it's kind of a cheap shot, to be honest with you, because right. nobody does it that way. And that sounds to me, I, I'm not saying a scholar couldn't say that. A, a trained scholar could say that. But I think it's rare. I think that's the kind of comment I get in emails from people who say, I've got 10 buddies who would argue with you, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it seems unfair for them to, it's almost like switching the uh, the goalposts. Um, you know, like they're trying to make evidence almost unfalsifiable at that point. Um, I guess we're going to switch gears and go to the NDEs now. And my question to you with that is, firstly, can you give us a brief overview of your work and research you've done in NDEs over your career? Sure. Um, I'd have to stop and count here how long after my study in the resurrection started that I get into NDEs. Probably five to 10 years. And I was going, five, let me clarify that five to 10 years after I got into the resurrection, I thought to myself, wow, NDEs would be an interesting topic because if there's an afterlife, that kind of jump starts an argument for the resurrection of Jesus. Because if there's an afterlife, you can't be so dead set against somebody coming back from the dead. Um, so I got into it. I started studying it. I started collecting cases. And in the old days, decades ago, in the old days, there were a few evidential cases here and there. People who said they saw things. And sometimes they tell it as soon as they come to in the hospital room or a day later. Um, they tell, you know, you know what I saw while I was out? I had this experience and I saw this, this these two these two nurses arguing down the hall, um, I saw a long hallway and I zipped in on them and, and I can tell you what their argument was about. Or they go to where their relatives are three floors away in a waiting room and they reproduce a conversation that you don't tell anybody what they said, but you ask them what they were talking about. But it can be, it can be really, really detailed information. Um, like uh, what somebody was, what their, their family was doing in a home nearby what wow. what in one, in one case what mom was making for dinner the specific uh meal and sometimes over over 30 cases the person who's giving the evidence that's verified has according to all the scientific data and the, and the medical doctors will say this according to the the data as far as is known there are no heart or brain waves. Uh, so if a person's, see the, the old objection 20 years ago was, is that guy irreversibly dead? Well, obviously not, he came back. Hmm, uh, was his heart still beating? I'm not sure, I don't have that information. Well, maybe his heart's not beating. But is his brain still functioning? Because any of this I'll say, well, that could be where the experiences come from. But, but two responses. First of all, there, there, like I said, there are dozens of cases now where the person has no measurable heart or brain activity, and they report data that they couldn't see if they were awake, conscious, in good health, staring out the window of their hotel and looking down at the highway below. Um, first of all, you, you'd never be able to report that kind of evidential data, especially seven floors away in the hospital, down the hallway, 40 feet. 
while you're strapped down in surgery. Um, sec secondly, is the the flat heart, flat brain thing alone. What I'm saying is you couldn't get that data even with an operating heart and brain. You couldn't get that data strapped down in a in a in an operation bed. But if the heart and brain are not working, now I think the naturalists really struggle. And you know, if you look online at some of these folks who I've been discussing who are kind of very committed to their atheism and they just kind of go off and and so on. They, they will come up. Someone just sent me a, a list of them the other day. They will come up with 15 objections while this material is not legit. And they won't even touch the field. They won't even touch the research they're dealing with. But I'm telling you what, um, the, the data are going to make you think twice. L let me share one stat with you that you might find just astounding. You asked me a little while ago, do atheists participate? I mean, not in person, but through their publications. Have I interviewed, do, do I look at atheists while I do empty tomb, for example? Well, in a recent survey of atheists and agnostics published, I don't know if he did the survey, but he publicized it by maybe a guy that I've heard called the best known skeptic in this country, not a Christian, best known skeptic in this country. And he produced the results of a, of a, uh, of an actual, you know, interview, interviews, uh, survey between atheists and agnostics. And in this survey, uh, just about 33%, just, just short of like a percentage point of uh, one third, atheists and agnostics believe in an afterlife. Now, <laughs> yeah, that, that's astounding I'll, I'll give a reason why in a minute, but that, that's astounding. But I think that reflects the news of evidential NDEs and unbelievers of any, any variety not knowing what to do with the data. And I've heard, um, I collect these when I see them. So I have guys that I have, I have publications or tapes, lectures from people who are among the best known atheists in the world. I'm thinking of two in particular, famous, famous people. Both of them don't believe in an afterlife. Both of them don't believe in God. And they both said, you know, I don't believe in an afterlife, but I hope there's a nice one for everybody. So wow. things are changing. And I think it's because of the evidence. Now, the reason I think that that's, rough information for skeptics to digest is because I, the other day I was checking the writings of the famous Bertrand Russell, the British, there were four British atheists who were very well known from the seventies up to uh, about 2010. And Bertrand Russell was one of the best known ones. And Bertrand Russell said he defined a Christian. This is a pretty loose definition, but he said the two cardinal doctrines that Christians have to believe in are the existence of God and an afterlife. And then he goes on and says, and they've got to have a pretty high view of Jesus too. He, he actually said, if they don't believe in the deity of Jesus, at least they should think he was a really good guy and a really good ethical leader. But he said on doc, uh, doctrinal issues, God and an afterlife. And it seems to me that if atheists and agnostics, one third of them in the survey are willing to allow an afterlife, I'll tell you what, if I were them, I would think I was getting too close to the fire. Yes, <laughs> but the evidence seems to be rich, but it could be a double-edged sword. But this is, I think this will be great for you to maybe address this. So people sure. like Bruce Grayson, he's like a huge figure in NDEs. And he's yep. um, he has reported numerous accounts of reincarnation from like past lives that includes intimate knowledge that no one could be privy to. So how right. do we reconcile that with our Christian faith with all these other accounts of like Hindus having afterlife um, sure. or NDEs and stuff? Yeah. Well, I'd give two answers, one to reincarnation and one to non-religious or non-Christian people talking about uh, experiences that they've had meeting Jesus or whatever. Um, reincarnation. Uh, if anybody wants to look this up, the book's out of print. And I can't send it to anybody because this was pre-computer. But uh, J.P. Moreland and I published a book years ago called Immortality. 
It was published later under the name Beyond Death. And I have a chapter in there on crucifixion. Uh, well, I have a, I talk about crucifixion in there too. But I have a chapter on reincarnation. And I give about, I think, in the neighborhood of 15, 18 critiques. And there's three or four of them that I think are devastating to the reincarnation argument. And then there's about a dozen others that just, you know, make some points that are hard to get around. But there's some big ones. And to me, the, the big comeback, one of, one of these three, is that the leading researcher of reincarnation. Oh, by the way, I should tell you, Bruce and I are good friends. I've known Bruce for, uh, I've known Bruce for 40 years. And actually, he and I did an interview on a, a NPR radio program about a year ago. A uh, year and a half ago. So, I mean, he's a great guy. Wonderful guy. MD, psychiatrist. And um, I've not heard Bruce do reincarnation. In fact, I got one lecture by him where he says he doesn't know of any evidence for reincarnation from oh, NDEs. Okay. But, but here's the big comeback. It's not Bruce because Bruce does NDEs. But the leading reincarnation expert who's pro, pro reincarnation, he says there's only two hypotheses that explain all the data. And those two hypotheses are reincarnation and possession. Oh, okay. Now, when he defines possession, I have to give this, if I'm writing in an article, I'd have to do this in a footnote, I guess, or in the text. Um, there's, there's at least two kinds of possession. And you might think of demon possession. I think he mentions it. But he spends more time talking about what's called discarnate possession. And discarnate possession would be if a human being is possessed by another human being who died years ago, who's been dead for, you know, 40 years and 20 years, whatever. Uh -huh. and, and they're possessed by a person that a person can can um, uh, possess a person. Be that as it may, whatever kind of possession you're talking about, person to person or, or spirit to person, however it's done, this guy went on and said, um, that can also explain the data. Because if somebody who knew you but has been dead for 10 years, um, you need a person who knows that data or can find out that data in the quote-unquote spirit world before they possessed you. And so this expert went on to say, yeah, both those ex explanations are basic. It's been a long time since I've read it, but I think he says they're both neck and neck. But he said, I prefer reincarnation. Well, that's okay. If he, if he prefers reincarnation, he prefers reincarnation. But, but if I have the resurrection and the resurrection is true, and therefore I can argue to a Christian worldview based on who Jesus is and what he taught, I think I'm going to go with spirit possession. You know, um, but even discarnate possession, uh, who knows what happens in the spirit world? We can think we've got verses for this and that can't happen. But I don't like those kind of I don't like kind of arguments where people construct an afterlife. From the point of death on based on how they interpret scripture, the only problem is the next guy who goes to the same church you do has the same degrees you do writes the same book you do only he disagrees with you with 90% of your arguments. So I, I, I don't like those kind of discussions. I'm just saying I don't know about discarnate possession, but it's kind of irrelevant. If possession can do the job. I think that's a bummer for reincarnationists. Um, a lot of other issues. Now, on the NDEs, um, you, you want me to break there? Do you, maybe I'm, I'm talking and talking and talking. Do you want me to go on to the uh, NDE point? I'm enjoying it all. I, you can keep on going, or if it's, uh, I'm, I'm fine with either. I just enjoy listening. <laughs> yeah, I, I know Bruce has no question about life after death from the NDEs. And I published a, a, a chapter in a book with a secular publication at secular press by the way they call them this press uh blackwell publishers out of oxford english calls himself the leading academic publisher in the world that's that's a pretty i, I mean they're they are right up by the top but it's pretty big to call yourself the best when you're right down the road from oxford university but anyway 
uh, I published an essay in there. I debated a guy. And in that essay, I refer to, I can't explain them all, but I refer to documents that contain reports on 300, over 300 cases. And now the number is probably way up to 400. I mean, I wrote this like, I'm not even sure, four or five years ago. Um, and the cases are coming in like crazy. So we might be up to 400, but but I, I've referred to 300 different evidential cases. And of the 300, maybe 20 of them are highly evidential. And so somebody will usually say to me, well, give me your best case. Well, I really can't, I, I can give you some cases, but I can't tell you my best case because the person I'm talking to, uh, it's what we call in philosophy, it's a person relative argument. The argument, the person who's doing the question might be, might, uh, be impressed with one evidence better than another one. And I think A is the best argument in the world. And they're going, eh, not bad, not bad. But I tell them B and they go, whoa, that really floats my boat, but it doesn't float my boat. So it depends on who you're talking to. But there's about 20 of them that are very, very difficult to refute. And I go back to that uh, survey with one, almost one third of atheists and agnostics. And I got the source, by the way, someone, I have to look for it, but somebody sent it to me. Um, why would one third of atheists and agnostics in the world believe in life after death? I think, I think that's a telling, oh yeah, a telling yeah. vote that, that shouldn't follow from naturalism. In fact, I'm corresponding right now. I've been corresponding for a while with a, with a, a really sharp atheist. And uh, he's just written me several letters and he's not ready to, he's not like quote, quote unquote converting or anything, but he said, he said, you know, I, I can't explain this stuff. I don't know where that goes. You really surprised me. We're not supposed to believe in that kind of stuff. So I think that's a more proper response. How do you get, how do you get an afterlife from naturalism? Right. And uh, really, I, I like how you explain that there. And this, I think this will flow to my next question. So what is the nature of some of these NDEs? Is there out of body experiences? I heard people floating to the top of the ceiling. Have you heard that type of stuff? And, is that is that is that typical for out of body experiences? Um, have you heard about that? Yeah, if they're going to be out of their body, probably the most common out of the body case type of case. There's other phenomena. I mean, there's what's called deathbed visions, and some people see things lying on their bed with their eyes open. But if you're talking about a, a near death, and by the way, some of those can be verified. But if you if a person has a near death experience, they often start up above their bed and they'll repeat what medical doctors said when they were uh, deeply anesthetized. They'll repeat things that go on in the room. Here's one for you. This is just a small one, but here's an example. Um, this one physician went down to talk to this uh, person who just been operated on and said, well, we're going to have to send this stuff away for tests and things. But from what I could see, just, just eyeball, um, you look like you're in pretty good shape. And we had some machines running that were checking the stuff out and they look good. And he mentioned a machine that was, it was, that was giving them data. And the, the person who had the NDE said, uh, doc, not to contradict you, but you don't have any data for that machine. And he said, the doctor said, how do you know? And then, and the <laughs> patient said, I was up above my body. And if you go down in the room and check, unless somebody's taking care of it, during the surgery, the machine was not plugged in. Oh, my gosh. You know, wow. that's a little one. I mean, that's an interesting one, but it's not a knockout. It's not one of those 20. Uh, the 20 I would pick would be the kind that, you know, you better change your atheism or agnosticism because it's not going to cut it if this thing's true. Um, there's 20 or mo more of those, but the, but the plug being on the wall, some of them are really, really interesting. Uh, some of the doctors told jokes during the surgery and, and the patient, uh, repeated them afterwards, but they were totally sedated. They were, they had a full, um, you see in the data where they talk about flat brain, flat heart cases, measurably, measurably flat brain, flat heart. Um, the other criterion that's almost as important or is, is when a person has a general anesthesia. But 
I don't like that one as much as the flat heart and flat brain, but a number of the general anesthesia people, they're not going to be reporting things like that. A person who's lightly sedated might hear something in the room. Um, and anybody can hear somebody say something later. They can say, you know, what was told while you were out, someone told a joke. That can happen. But not data that are going on at that same time, which, of, which there's a lot of cases where they see something else uh, a fair ways away while they're out. And it only happened during the surgery by definition. Uh, if I told you the examples, you'd, you'd see what I mean. But these ex experiences could only happen during the surgery. When the surgery is over, this situation no longer exists a um, hundred yards away. And because of the nature of it. And they tell people what happened and they they ask the people involved and don't tell them what the person said. Just say, what were you doing then? I was doing this. Exactly what the person said. Now, that should not be repeated accurately in the presence of, as far as we know, absence of brain and heart information. To me, that's that's too close to the beginning stages of an afterlife. I agree completely. Um, there's there's certain factions of Christianity, like Christian physicalists. Do you think they could reconcile some of these NDE accounts with like Christian physicalism, or does it really denote uh, dualism um, or something along those lines, or idealism? Yeah, great question. Uh, physicalists, the the uh, they go by different names, but the non-reductive materialists. Or, you know, Christians who think you're dead and you're buried and you're not conscious, but at the re resurrection of the dead, you'll be conscious and you have to trust God to get it all right and give you give you you back, even if you are eaten by jaws or burned in a fire. Um, but I, I think I think this is a huge refutation of that, because I don't know anybody who says, even if it's for a short time. I don't know anybody who says when you're dead, you're dead and nothing's there until the end of time or the view that says when you're dead, you're dead and nothing else happens. If you take those views and you've got this data from people, sometimes hours later, and you and they give you data that can be checked out, a police report, um, you know, interviewing somebody who right. repeatedly said something and that shouldn't be going on. So no, I don't think uh, re sometimes called reconstitutionalism, people who believe um, non-reductive materialists, these are all similar names. Um, I don't think they have a chance with this data. I think either you have to refute the data or you need to change your view. I agree completely. I appreciate that, Dr. Habermas. Um, and also a lot of these NDs that I've looked into have Jesus as part of these visions they have. And so what would, be, what would be some of the commonalities in the testimonies that you've heard that people who met Jesus during an NDE, is that something you've, is that something popular or not? Very, very, very popular. In fact, very frequently, the people who say Jesus appeared to them are not Christians. Wow. That's an interesting phenomenon. But you know what? When I asked you a little while ago, do you want me to stop talking? Do you want to go to another question? You were asking me at that time, what about Buddhists and Hindus? who have NDEs, but they have NDEs, they have visions, whatever, they have experiences, let's put it that way. They have experiences in their own belief systems, and it's not Christian. Well, does that bother you? Okay, uh, no, and I'll tell you why. First of all, it happens, but, but, uh, but bottom line, this is not my answer. I don't want anybody to say, oh, I heard Habermas say this on a talk show. Um, Bottom line, if Jesus died for our sins, was buried, rose again, and offers salvation to the to the world, you know, classic verses, John 3, 16, and so on, and he offers it to the world, and later somebody tells me he's not a Christian, but they saw Jesus and so on and so on and so on, I think my proper response might be, so you're saying Christianity is true, yep. You're saying Jesus was raised from the dead. Yep. But you're saying this Hindu and this Buddhist both had really good experiences. Yep. All right. This is not my view. But I would say, if that's true, here's my response. Well, then praise the Lord. 
Uh, you know, we all, we often have a statement that goes like this. Heaven's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven that we don't expect to see there. And there's going to be a lot of people who are not there that we expected to see there. So if God says somebody's in, guess what? I'm not arguing. Okay. I don't know what happened with that person. Uh, there's a famous case of a, uh, a, a philosopher, an Oxford philosopher, who had a near-death experience. And there are a number of these sorts of things. And they saw a life review. They said, no, nah, I'm more, more open to the afterlife than I was before. They say things like that. Who knows what happens if they spent five minutes with Jesus? They're claiming that. I'll tell you in a minute why I don't believe that's true. But if they spent five minutes with Jesus... Who says what's going on between five minutes and right. you and him? Are you going to tell him what happened in his experience? That's silly. So what I'm saying is bottom line, if you can't refute the resurrection and you can't refute NDEs, I think Christian worldview looks pretty good. God can do what he wants with everybody else. But I that's completely not, agree. That's not, I'm sorry? I, I completely agree with you, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that's possible. That's not my view. I'm just saying the worst it gets is I'm not sure about these other folks and what happened, but that's between them and the Lord. Okay, but here's my, my full answer. Whenever you give evidential NDE cases, the evidence is almost without exception about something in this world. The examples I used were what your relatives were doing in the waiting room, three floors, seven floors away. Uh, one case was what relatives did when they went down to get a bite to eat many floors and across the big hospital. Um, what the nurses were talking about down the hallway, the machine that was unplugged, uh, who cracked the joke during the surgery. Um, those, there, there are this worldly kind of things, things you can report, obviously, because you, if you're going to check them out, you got to report them. Now, when someone says I was with Jesus for five minutes. And you know they were out for 15 minutes. I mean, I'm listening. Go ahead. So, yes, I was with Jesus for five minutes, and he told me I was fine and I'm coming back. Okay, here's my problem. None of those testimony cases are reliable. In general, though, just general comment. They're not reliable because guess what? There's no data. So, mm. a Christian could say I was with Jesus. A Jewish individual could say... An angel appeared to me, and I was a perfect peace. Um, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu could have their own visions. I can listen. I could say, wow, I haven't heard one like that before. But I don't go ahead and say, wow, everything's true, because there's no backup. Now, someone goes, well, I'll bet you like the hell cases, because you're a Christian. Actually, I don't. I don't right. like, I, I shouldn't say hell cases. Let's call them hell testimonies. There are about 20, 18 to 20% of people in that last survey I saw, 18 to 20% of NDEers have hellish experiences. I don't believe those either. What if it's because you were raised in the Bible Belt and you had preaching jammed down your throat when you were a little kid and you've always thought you were a bad person and you pictured yourself being in hell? I, I can't, I can't verify or falsify that. So, just to show, show you I'm an equal opportunity uh, <laughs> unbeliever in the heavenly portions, the visions of, of heaven. Um, I don't believe when someone tells me a report from Jesus. I'm, I'm not saying it's not true. Here's this very important criterion. I'm not saying it's not true, but I'm saying I have no way to know it's true. It's, an, it's what philosophers would call an epistemic objection. It could have been true. Jesus may have told you this, and he may not have, and you may not have seen Jesus. I mean, how would I know? Oh, so you don't think Bob, Bob, a committed Christian, saw Jesus? I'm not saying he didn't. I'm saying I can't know that. Oh, well, what about the Hindu? Who knows what he what what went on? I'm not going to argue when he said he was feeling good during that time, but I don't know. And what about the guy who said he went to hell? I can't verify that. I'll listen, but I can't verify it. So. My answer is, is no, I'm not bothered with world religious NDEs because the part of the testimony I can trust is the part that's verified. And almost always, without exception, the part that's verified is what happens in this world and can be checked out. 
so that the, the testimonies, I mean, how about this one? How about when people in other religions say they see dream, dreams of Jesus? Well, that's cool. Maybe. Do I know of any good cases that I'm sure about? No. Are you saying they didn't happen? No. Could they have happened? Yes. Do you know they did? No. <laughs> it's, the same kind of, it's the same kind of thing. If someone said they dreamed about Jesus last night and they're totally healthy, I wouldn't be prepared to die for it. They might be, but I wouldn't be prepared to die for it. So we don't normally take somebody's testimony in church and run out and change the world based on your testimony. Um, anyway, that's my long-winded answer. The two parts are God can do what he wants to do with people going to heaven. And But that <laughs> that's my view that God's going to make that decision, but that's not how I answer these things. The way I answer these things is to say I don't buy the spiritual testimonies as being provable right uh, i appreciate that dr habermas and we have a question from doki doki bible club um gary has there been any new novel objections to the resurrection since the jesus seminars the jesus seminar is still in operation a number of their people have published uh, my good friend, Mike Lacona, who wrote probably, I, I mean, I, I believe without question, the best historical book on the resurrection today, uh, The Resurrection of Jesus by Mike, doctoral dissertation, about 750 pages or so. Um, Mike debated one of the top guys in the Jesus seminar. And I believe William Lane Craig debated two other top guys in the Jesus seminar, three different people. And the evangelicals did <laughs> Very, very well. We got the we got the data. But what I'm saying is I read I read their things. I've read these guys like crazy. I, I read more critics than I read Christians for sure. And I am not aware of a new theory. Um, you know, the old saying there's nothing new under the sun. I think that's kind of true on naturalistic theories. Naturalistic theories can be construed differently. There can be different ways to argue things, but I'm not aware of a new theory. Great, appreciate that. Um, so this goes along with the resurrection. Why aren't there any non-apocryphal or non-biblical accounts of the resurrection? And does the lack of external historical records of the resurrection aid or hinder its historical credence? Okay, good questions. Uh, yes, the resurrection is mentioned. I, I, now I can give a variety of, of, of levels of uh, our species of the evidence here. There are a number of reports about Jesus' resurrection being true that are outside of the Christian canonical New Testament. In other words, the 27 books New Testament canon. Uh, yeah, there's sources outside. You go, well, yeah, but they're all your Christian friends. Well, a lot of them are Christian, but not all of them are Christian. And there's a lot, there's a number of Gnostic sources. Uh, the Gnosticism, which was declared a heresy in the early church, but a number of them write about and, and allow the resurrection. Uh, one of them, one kind of a semi-Gnostic book, is the uh, Gospel of the Hebrews. It only exists in fragments. And this isn't a good evidence. Uh, I don't think it's a good evidence at all. I'm just answering the question. Uh, in yeah. the Gospel of Hebrews, one of the fragments narrates the story of Jesus appearing to James uh, after his crucifixion, his brother James. So yeah, there there are that that's kind of a Jewish. It's called the Jewish Gospel. That, oh, wow. there's, a, there's a group of gospels called Jewish Gospels, and I guess these people are somewhere in between Judaism and Christianity. I really don't know, but because we don't know much about them. I mean, in this case, for ninety something percent of the thing is missing. Um, yeah, Josephus seems to reply to, uh, I won't be dogmatic, but he seems to refer to the resurrection, but he didn't say it happened. He said his followers believed it happened. They said he appeared to them. Well, that, that's totally true. Skeptics believe that today. Um, and uh, other sources outside the New Testament, yeah, some of these are Christians. Some of these are Gnostic. Some of these are, there are historical accounts. There's probably, you can put together a life of Jesus from secular sources alone from about up till about 150 years after the cross. So in other words, up till about 180 AD. So there's a lot more source than you might think, but a word, I, I get a, I get that question a lot. And I think what the person means is this, 
I need something outside the New Testament because my friend won't let me use the New Testament because it's prejudiced. Well, right. see, that's the kind of person I'm talking about. I don't mean the person, but that's the kind of situation I'm talking about where they don't know what the scholars are doing. And if you talk to an atheist, uh, Bart Ehrman, uh, he just passed away, unfortunately, but Garrett Erdem, not, not Bart Ehrman didn't pass away, but Garrett Ludeman, the, uh, the uh, German atheist, German New Testament scholar, just passed away. These guys will tell you all kinds of things that we can know. And you know what they do? They cite the New Testament. You go, well, that's not fair. Why would an atheist cite the New Testament? Because they, a real, real simple rule. They only cite the data which are verifiable. Now, I can't get into how they know it's verifiable. I just know that they cite it. And I tell people, if you go into a discussion with an atheist New Testament scholar and you think you're going to not use verses because they're going to be prejudiced against them, guess what? They will use many more verses than you will use. It's like the spider. Uh, I don't know if this is true. Biologists have told me supposedly it is, but spiders don't get caught in their own nets, net, uh, uh, you know, webs, because they know which strands to run on and which strands not to run on. Um, it's like that. Scholars know which verses to use and which ones not to use. And you can put together an historical Jesus. And Bart Ehrman, for example, will tell you that Paul is our number one source. And he's not the only one. Many, many, many critical scholars will tell you that Paul is our number one source on Jesus. So what if he wrote these books and he was a Christian? Uh, there are ways to check to see if his reports are true. And so when a guy tells me you can't use the New Testament because it's prejudice, that tells me that most likely, number A, they don't know the data. B, they don't know what the critical atheist scholars are saying or other agnostic skeptics. They don't know what they're saying. And three, I get a feeling they say that because they don't want you lose, using it because you're going to lose. They're going to use lose the discussion if you can use the New Testament. But now go back and ask why all the atheist New, uh, New Testament professors are Jewish New Testament professors like uh, that. These two are, are deceased, but two major ones in, in the last uh, couple of decades, uh, Geza Vermesh, an Oxford Jewish historian, and uh, Pincus Lapid, a Jewish scholar with a, get this, a Jewish scholar with a PhD in New Testament from a German university. And Lapid wrote a book arguing that the resurrection of Jesus happened. <laughs> um, wow. And Vermesh writes a book where he goes, well, I'm agnostic on the actual event, but none of the natural, you asked earlier about whether there's any good naturalistic, new naturalistic theories. Vermesh says none of them work. And he's not a believer. So we're on very, very good grounds when we say we've got data for this. And the atheist specialists are not going to say, what, 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 what? Did you say Paul? Can't use Paul. Prejudiced. They will never say that. And that's right. why you start with people who have PhDs in the field, even if they're not believers. I'll tell you this. I, I read the skeptics way, way, way more than I read uh, Christians on the resurrection. I want to know what they're saying. And that's why I really have a great respect for you because you do uh, tackle these arguments from the skeptics. And going along the, those lines of the skeptics, um, this will be like a two-prong with both NDEs and the resurrection. So right. what if skeptics argue that the NDEs are just a god of the gas fallacy? And why can't, if the, if what, what kind of level of evidence should we pin on the resurrection if it's not observable, testable, and repeatable? And why should we accept that as evidence if it's not um, observable, testable, and repeatable? Well, you've got a number of questions that are rolled together. But let me yeah. just let me just take swipes at a few of them. Which one sure. are they referring to, Indies or the resurrection, when they say it's God of the gaps? The NDEs, they'll say, well, we just, you're just saying it's God. Well, it could be anything. It could be just an uh, undiscovered law of nature we haven't discovered yet. Okay, see, now that's a guy who doesn't know what I've said or where I'm coming from, because I don't say it's God. I don't say, and if somebody tells me they saw Jesus and he said he was God, I'd say that's very nice, but it wouldn't become part of my theology. <laughs> so I've already explained <laughs> that. But it, they can say it's God of the gaps. You know why? Because they're threatened by it. 
They're yeah. threatened by it. If these fellow atheists and agnostics believe almost one third that there's an afterlife, I don't want to be mean, but some of these guys are squirming. Because an afterlife usually means you have to give some kind of an account. I don't care how you define the word account, but you got to do something. So it's not God of the gaps. And here's my better response. It can't be God of the gaps when there's empirical evidence. If I can cite something that a person sees that's a knockout evidence, you can't tell me it's God of the gaps if you can't explain the data. Um, now, a couple of the other ones. You asked something else about uh, resurrection? Right. If How could we regard resurrection as tangible evidence if it's not testable, repeatable, or cannot make predictions? Okay, let me... Let me uh, ask a question, a historical question. How can you believe in uh, George Washington, George Washington, the first president of the United States, if you can't talk to George, you can't get him on the phone, you don't have anything that gives you that data, no photographs, no telephone calls. How do you know George Washington, the first president of the United States? See, and that's that, a great that, point. Yeah. That's the field known as history. And history gives when this person says there's no empirical evidence, you have empirical evidence for George. You go, well, how are you defining empirical? Empirical is testimonial evidence that can be verified. Historical evidence is admissible in a court of law. And I go, well, what would that evidence look like? I don't even know if these things exist, but did his wife write a diary that we know is hers? Did he write a diary? Um, did somebody else write an account of early colonial America when they... I had the big war with Britain and and uh, this and that happened. And I was under George Washington. He was a great leader because of this and that. Or he was a lousy leader because of this, that, and this and that. That's history. And you have to you have to study it. So that objection is not empirical. But um, like I said, it's admissible in a court of law. Here's, a, here's another objection, though. I, I think the minimal facts argument, where I only use these six facts, I talked about the list of 12 that I reduced to six, and the six I use, which are enough to show the resurrection happened. Um, when I do that argument, but by the way, let me stop you for a second, or stop me for a second. There's been <laughs> two, I think both best-selling biographies, one of George Washington and one of Jefferson, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. I got both on my shelf. I'm, I'm looking at them right now. Uh, these two, they're huge. They're big books, like 900,000 pages. And the author says, the historians, they say at the beginning, we're going to use a principle popularized by Gary Habermas. We're only going to use historical facts that we know to exist about George Washington and the other book that we know to exist about Franklin. And they do history <laughs> based on knowable facts. And, and they're bestsellers. I'm looking at them right here. Um, so that they use those. Uh but here's here's something that might bother some people. I'm not. I think the minimal facts argument is the strongest argument there is for the resurrection. But here's one I'm not so sure of, but I'm pretty sure of. If the shroud of Turin is the burial garment of Jesus, if it is, I could sit here all day and give empirical data. Guess what? The data on the cloth is measurable, weighable, quantifiable, photographical and repeatable so there is possibly something that fulfills that so anyway amen and uh, i think we're going to conclude it there because we're right at an hour and man that was an what a captivating discussion man <laughs> uh well, thank you. The audience loved it, uh, Dr. Habermas, and um, I know you're a busy man. You have a lot of things going on, and uh, so we'll let you get going here. I appreciate your time. I, Man, that was worth it. I was looking forward to this, and you did not let down. I, everything I hoped for was met in this discussion. Thank you so much. Hey, I'll tell you, your question, when, when you do hundreds of interviews like I've done, uh, not everybody has good questions. Some of them, if they order a book and they're going to do a review of your book on the air. Um, let's be frank, uh, from their questions, they didn't read the book. They asked things and I never said that. And you have to politely uh, correct them and everything else. Your questions were fantastic. I thought you were hitting the uh, nail on the head. And I never once thought to myself, lousy question. Where did he come up with that one? Um, 
So I thought you did a really, really good job. And I appreciate, I appreciate doing interviews that. when one question after another hits the nail on the head and you could address the real issues and not pseudo issues. Yes. And that's what I want to do. I want to have, uh, a, you know, a, a, at least were uh, some questions that I thought would that people care about, you know, and they want to get these yep. out there. So I appreciate that. Yep. And yep. Uh, we'll end it there. The whole awesome. Awesome, Dr. Habermas. So we're going to call it a day here. And okay. uh, we have, uh, we're going to post your book up here and promote that. Um, so, oh, by the way, can I, can I give my, sure. uh, my uh, website? Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, my website's uh, www.garyhabermas.com. That's just all one word, no dots, bells, dashes. Uh, G A R Y H A B E R M A S. Um, it's had millions and millions of hits over the years, and there's uh, answers to a lot of these questions. There's there's a couple of free books online, ebooks that are free for the taking from my website. Uh, published material that people ask me the most about. You ask one of the questions, what do we know about Jesus out from his non-Christian sources outside the New Testament? It's a whole chapter on that. I would welcome people to go there. I also have a YouTube channel, so people can look that up on YouTube, and there's probably, I'm just guessing, 120, 130, and a new one going up tomorrow morning, um, a, new, a new lecture. So I would welcome people who are interested for more to find what they want. Awesome. I'm going to check out some of your books that you mentioned with the uh, NDEs and also like the, the Hindu stuff. And I'm going to uh, definitely check that out. Excellent. So thank you very much. Well, God bless everyone. Uh, we will catch you later and uh, take care. Thank you very much. Good interview.